Hello everyone, Max here with Fiction Rant to talk with you all about phasers from Star Trek. Also, I have links in the description to my coffee and merch store if you want to support the channel. And the store even has a brand new item, a Powered by MacGuffinite mug. So if you like that or any of the other stuff on offer, please follow the link and get one for yourself. Also, if there's anything else you'd prefer to see the same designs on but aren't seeing them on the store yet, like the same pattern but on a hat or a mug or whatever it happens to be, let me know and I'll see about putting something together. Okay, phasers. They're probably the most iconic weapon from Star Trek and come in all shapes and sizes from tiny type 1 phasers that are about the size of a key fob to prototype phase cannons that we get to see in Star Trek Enterprise to big old phaser arrays like we start seeing in uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. The problem is trying to quantify these weapons is pretty tricky. Do you just go by what's said about them throughout the shows with megawatts of energy being thrown around? Do you go by the latest from Strange New Worlds, which has each phaser outputting half the energy of Earth's sun, or 1.61 times 10 to the 26th watts? Do you go by the old TNG manual, which claims that each emitter only outputs 5.1 megawatts of energy, but each array contains up to 200 emitters for just over a gigawatt of output? Complicating things further, phasers shoot nadion particles, which are basically subatomic particles which can disintegrate matter. In effect, this means that if a laser is a squirt gun, a phaser is a squirt gun shooting acid. Basically, it's all really confusing and is the source of many a fan slash nerd debate. Personally, I try to defer to demonstrations of strength when trying to quantify any weapons that we see in sci-fi or whatever, but those are horribly inconsistent as well, and most demonstrations are against shielded and or armored targets, which are unfortunately made up of the same mythical materials and properties as phasers. So, it's like saying that a unicorn horn can penetrate adamantium. Helpful to know in context, but totally impossible to actually quantify in real terms. So, I've been going down the rabbit hole on this a bit, and was looking over the old TNG manual when it struck me. In the same section where it says that each emitter on a Galaxy Class uh, type 10 phaser emits 5.1 megawatts of energy, it also says that type 1 and 2 phasers, phaser pistols basically, are limited to only 0 0.01 megawatts. Okay, now that is interesting. Even if in the same manual it also says that the information might be intentionally inaccurate for security purposes, whatever, we'll go with it anyway. Okay, so we've seen time and time again that both type 1 and 2 phasers can vaporize people which is literally impossible to do with only 0.01 megawatts of energy. So clearly there's something else going on to let them actually output that kind of damage while emitting so little energy. So I turned to AI for some calculations. Yes, I can do them by hand, but AI is faster, easier, and generally more accurate than me with pen and paper. So according to Microsoft Copilot, vaporizing a 200 pound or 90.7 kilogram human, clothes and all, would require about 3.9 gigajoules of energy. Okay, so in Star Trek math, 0.01 megawatts is enough to output 3.9 gigajoules of energy in about a second. That's a 390,000 times discrepancy. Interesting. So what if we apply that exact same discrepancy to ship uh, phaser output? That means that a single emitter is instead putting out 1.989 terawatts, and that the whole array is outputting 397.8 terawatts. For perspective, that's about 95 megatons per second, almost two Zarbamba nukes per second. And that's minimum. Remember, this is all based on the energy required to vaporize a 200 pound person. Hand phasers haven't really demonstrated an upper limit on how big a target can be before they can't fully be vaporized, so that figure can easily go up a bit, though probably not orders of magnitude higher based on what we've seen. So what does this mean? And is it representative of what phasers can actually demonstrably do? Good question. First things first, we need actual demonstrations to point to. Big numbers are all fine and good, but again, if they're demonstrably inaccurate, they can't be right. I'll highlight two examples. One example being Enterprise Season 1 Episode 12, Silent Enemy, where the newly installed prototype phase cannons are tested by firing on a mountain described to be roughly the size of Mount Denali slash McKinley, pretty much destroying the whole thing. There's a couple caveats here, since the phase cannons were overloaded, but at the same time, they're also over 200 years old as of the events of the Dominion War. Alright, so I had Grok run the numbers for me, since I don't want to do all the complicated math by hand. Uh, sorry for switching AIs on us, but it's just math. So, assuming that the mountain was pulverized, but not particularly thoroughly, the strike needed to hit with at least 5 kilotons of energy. That's our low end. On the high end, if some of the mountain was vaporized, the energy jump needed jumps up to 3 megatons, 
And if we assume that the whole thing was vaporized, that jumps to 9 to 10 gigatons, but it's pretty apparent from the visuals that's not what actually happened, because there was a big old dust cloud. So, prototype phase cannon hits between 5 kilotons and 3 megatons. Fast forward a couple hundred years to the next generation era, and we get Season 7, Episode 10, Inheritance, where a sustained 19-second shot is used to drill a hole in the mantle of a planet to fix some geological issues. It's unclear what the diameter of this hole was, but we'll assume is between 1 and 10 meters in diameter for upper and lower limits. For 1 meter, that's 18.8 megatons, and for 10 meters, that's 1.88 gigatons. But this is spread over 19 seconds, so the low end is about 990 kilotons per second, and the high end is about 99 megatons per second. That is assuming that the rock involved was vaporized, since that makes the most sense visually. The alternative is total atomic disintegration, but that's rather more difficult to quantify. All right. Back to the tech manual. With my conversion that accounts for vaporizing people with tiny amounts of energy, we had a total phaser array output of 95 megatons per second. Well, hey, that almost perfectly matches what we see on screen for the 10 meter hole drilling. Well then, so what about Strange New Worlds numbers? If the drilling was done using that kind of energy output, of half the sun's energy, the drilling would not have taken 19 seconds. Instead, it would take about 50 picoseconds, or 50 trillionths of a second. That would not be practical. So they just can't fire for that short of a duration. Like, that would be a short enough amount of time that you probably wouldn't even see the phaser beam. It's such a tiny amount of time. So yeah, not practical. But it's possible that the phasers were massively dialed back in order to perform the drilling in a safer manner, but they'd have to be massively dialed back. There was plenty of engineering set up in the episode to perform the operation, but it'd be pretty remiss of me to just hand wave the whole thing and assume that phasers are millions of times more powerful than demonstrated just because some setup was done. So let's approach this from another angle. According to the same manual, a photon torpedo carries one and a half kilograms of antimatter, which then reacting with one and a half kilograms kilograms of matter e equals mc squared says that that should have a yield of about 64 megatons. Now it's true that torpedoes have configurable yield, but they're also generally more powerful than individual phaser shots, at least per second. So that yield probably isn't all that accurate since that would make standard yield about 30% weaker than the per second yield of phasers. Well, let's apply the same multiplier as for the phasers. Oh, yeah, that would mean that the payload would need to be carrying about half a million kilograms of antimatter. Yeah, torpedoes aren't the size of small naval warships. They're more the size of coffins, and much of that space is taken up with propulsion and guidance systems. Well, how big of a payload could a torpedo carry? Based on the TNG manual entries, the standard yield of a torpedo is 18.5 isotons, or about 3.48 megatons per isoton, since isoton is a made-up number or as a made-up unit, and they're configurable up to 25 isotons or 87 megatons. However, the Voyager manual has that increased to a potential yield of 200 isotons for a total yield of about 1.3 gigatons. Granted, this particular yield breaks some treaty or other, which raises its own set of questions. Okay, so a torpedo can carry far more energy yield than phasers can output in a second or two, if we go by the calcs that I've been doing, but are still massively outclassed by the Strange New World phasers. So, are the Strange New World's phasers actually representative of what Trek ships can actually really do in combat? And we're missing something about what's going on with all these examples? Well, let's look to this Deep Space Nine episode, The Die is Cast, where a combined Cardassian and Romulan fleet attacks the Founder homeworld, destroying about 30% of the planet's crust in a short but unspecified amount of time. For the sake of argument, let's assume that all 20 of those ships were only using disruptors that were the equivalent of 100-year-old phasers. That would mean that the Founder world is being hit by the energy equivalent of about 10 of our sun's total energy output every second, destroying the aforementioned 30% of the crust. Assuming that the crust was pulverized and dispersed but not vaporized would take about 2 minutes and 41 seconds. Huh. So what's going on here? It would seem that the Strange New World's numbers might jive with the die's cast just fine. Uh, again, the time frame is unknown, but has to be short, like they're supposed to do the entire planet, which means they have to orbit it and all that kind of stuff. They're supposed to be able to do that within about an hour, but that still makes photon torpedoes not really make any sense at all. <sighs> well, I have an explanation, but it might be a bit of a lame justification, but for now, it's all I've got. In the Strange New Worlds episode in question, phasers are being used to power the MacGuffin of the day. 
It's not a combat situation. That means they're able to divert all power from shields, engines, replicators, life support, whatever, everything, to the phasers. In the die's cast, the fleet was specifically tasked with destroying the Founder homeworld and thus prepared for that task. Plus, they had more advanced weaponry than in the prequel series. It would make sense that the weapons that they were used were specifically configured for demolition, which would also help explain why they were basically helpless against the ensuing Jem'Hadar counterattack. If they nerfed their defenses and engines to get the necessary power, that could help explain why they were so helpless and also keep the numbers for torpedoes making at least more sense. So basically the best I can come up with for why the numbers stated might be still accurate is that the amount of energy a Star Trek ship can project if that's basically all they're doing is around half of what a star outputs. But then again, they're also getting better as time goes on. But yeah, these numbers are not actual combat feats. They're like, you're not maneuvering and blocking attacks while firing this hard, which means that these numbers aren't actually, all, at least the, the Strange New Worlds numbers, they're not that useful for any kind of matchup. In Strange New Worlds, it's a dedicated scientific operation, not a combat scenario. And in DS9, it's basically a sneak attack demolition from a bunch of cloaked ships, not a situation where they were expecting to have to actually, you know, defend against fire and maneuver and avoid attacks while doing the demolition. So it's a very different kind of scenario that they specially, they specifically set their fleet up to be able to accomplish. Now, the only issues now are just how the heck do you actually produce that kind of energy without switching to something like zero point energy or something which has, you know, the potential is, well, we don't know. It's as high as we really want it to be. But then the other issue is how do you channel that much energy through your phasers without just slagging them? Fortunately, that's a problem for me to think about some other time and for the writers of Strange New Worlds to just never give any thought whatsoever, adding to the continual nerd debates that have gone on for decades now. And with that, I'll wrap this one up. Let me know in the comments if what you think about all this, and be sure to check out the merch store and or coffee account if you want to support the channel, and until next time, live long and prosper, and may the force be with you.